Thanks so much for coming out tonight to hear some poems. So much beauty in the world trills Macy Gray, and the studio crew claps rhythmically into the mic, as though the response to beauty should be applause. And in fact, it was each summer evening in the 80s at the outdoor cafe on the cliff on Eos, where the rousing final movement of Vorjak was synced to the sun's declension, so that the orchestra crescendoed, then abruptly ceased at the precise moment the amaranthine disk of sun dissolved into the Aegean. All of us burnt and stoned and giddy as we burst into applause before nimbling the goat paths to hostels where we showered in anticipation of the modest debaucheries of night. But it's the applause that stays with me rather than the ravers on holiday in their sheer linens and seamless tans, the applause and the beauty that provoked it, the sunset so elemental in that sparse landscape, the inexhaustible swiving of sun and sea, the hissing we thought we heard below the cellos and violas and timpani, less the devil's beckoning tongue than the sizzle of skin, perversely pleasurable, more than enough sacrifice for our sins as we stared all day at each other's bodies, then entered them each night, that sibilant pssst, louder as flesh touched flesh in imitation of sun and sea, in homage to sun and sea, to so much beauty in the world. Oh, Macy Gray, I'm clapping along right now, stopped at the traffic light, years and miles away from the island, which still blazes in beauty without me. Even at this hour, when all the young fuckers who have followed my hoof prints sigh in their sleep, and the sun slips out of the sea with no one watching, not one lost a sylph searching for her sandal, or ghost of shepherd, or farmer on donkey, to begin this day with the joyful prayer of applause. I'm going to stay on this island of Eos for a couple of poems. It's, in the, it's a Greek island in the Cyclades, and I lived there off and on during the 1980s, sometimes for as long as five months. This is last day on Eos. Blunt nubbins birthed on dainties whiffled into your draw. The mice pulsated pinkly, transparent, Six erasers lacking graphite to lend them purpose. So I swaddled them in the silk sling of one thong, black eye beads absorbing the wince sharp blast of sky, out of which wings gyred as I fluttered the tribe onto stubble. Six micey nuggets, six snouty baubles, babes whisked by beaks to raucous treetop nurseries. For how many hours did my shadow needle our garden, startled by the first knowledge of our fate, to be driven naked and ashamed, imparadised beyond the unlatched gate. So back in the mid 80s, my parents were coming over to, to visit and I wanted to take them to some of the islands. But Eos was one of those places where um, a lot of you know, European teenagers would go. It was a nude beach and I figured my parents wouldn't, weren't going to be so comfortable there. And so I looked at some other islands and I, I went to this island called Skiathos. And while I was there one night this dog came out and I gave him some food that I was eating and he wound up staying with me then for the rest of that week. He just was with me everywhere. When I went back to my room at night, he slept outside the door. And when I opened the door in the morning to come out, he was waiting there and he just started trotting along with me. 
And when I left the island, got onto the ferry, he was there, right there on the pier, then watching me pull away. And I, felt, I thought, oh, what a great dog this was. Wish I could bring him home, right? So about a month later, my parents come, and we're taking the ferry back to the island. And I said, oh, and it was this really cool dog that I like so much, you know, and maybe we'll see him, who knows, and stuff. So we get there, and that night we're eating at a cafe, and I say, look, and here comes the dog, and he's just kind of trotting along, trotting along, he looks over at me, and he looks back, and then he goes, whoa, like that. It was this great, like, doggy double take. And I thought, oh. and then he wound up hanging out with us for the whole rest of that week, too. So we go, we go home, say goodbye again, and I tell my friends in Athens about this dog, and they all look at each other, and they say, oh, you know what happens to those dogs once the tourists leave? And I thought, well, no, I didn't know what happened to them, and why would I want to know about that anyway? And so, I don't know if this poem makes it fully clear, but I hope so. It's called Zeus, Cyclops, Plato, Gaia. Home in winter, bored backpackers scroll through pics of dogs they fed all summer, recalling the names given them how each skinny rag hobbled from a doorway to tug lamb sausage from outstretched fingers, then offered one ear to be stroked before following those hands to hostels where they waited all night in the courtyard, huddled with cousins, dreaming of sheep. How the dogs yipped on the wharf as the ferry slipped away before slinking back to shadowy nooks before shepherds, once October diminished, swept through cobbled village streets to hoist, scruff by scruff, onto the beds of empty vegetable trucks, all the island dogs they could gather, then clattered the dirt road to the God-shunned cliffs, overlooking in every thumb to photo the unforgivably blue Aegean. So what would happen is that um, when they weren't being fed any longer, the dogs would form packs, and then they would go after the sheep. And so the farmers needed to, to get rid of them. So, and if you got through that winter, and then you, you snuck around again uh, when the tourists came back. So here's another poem. This, this is a poem set in Mihaila's uh, Romania. And, um, there's, a, there's a hat that you see men wearing in Eastern Europe and in the Middle East and into India, in fact. And it's, it's a kind of hat that from the side, um, it looks like it's kind of curly wool. And from the side, it looks like a, a boat or a football. And from front, it's kind of a, a triangle. And it's called a caracool. And this poem is about that hat, caracool. In summer, the storks nest on telephone poles. Their fledglings peep over the round rims of straw and sometimes spill to the blacktop below where feral cats make quick work of their bones. The nests remain empty all winter until those stalks return to the same nest once more. This winter, Isis has been all over the news, dragging blades across journalists' throats, kindling gas-soaked soldiers in cages, flinging gay students off rooftops of mosques, hammering to rubble the ancient sites. Better to begin again with cruelty so the world might be purged of its past. Here, as in many parts of the East, every man of a certain age wears a wool caracool through winter. The best hats are sewn from the pelts of lamb fetuses slit from the womb, and bought by politicians to flaunt and wave as they march in national holiday parades. Next in quality are the pelts of newborns killed as they slip from mother to pasture. A single skin equals a single hat. It's the workmanship and the material the wooden needle looping infinities as the bobbin spins out the fur, its incomparably soft liquid texture with subtle shadings ranging from eggshell white to northern night that set the caracool apart, but still 
In the back of my mind, there endure the crinkled corpses, the mothers crying out for their offspring, and the men who continue to perfect their art. I don't know, I should read another poem or two from the new book before reading some of these new poems. Are you doing okay so far? Yeah? I know, I'll lighten it up with something funny. <laughs> and this will be a new poem. So I, um, I love being here. I want to thank Suzanne for inviting me back. I read here first just um, eight years ago. I hope eight years from now she'll invite me back. Um, when I first moved here in 2008, even before I arrived, um, I had gotten a letter um, in inviting me to give a, a reading here, and then came and met Suzanne and, and the other remarkable poets here, Laura and Michael, and, and felt immediately welcomed into this uh, community, uh, more welcomed here, in fact, than in my home school at first. So, uh, so, and I've always been terrifically grateful um, for that and have a great spot for you guys. And, and I've met so many of you who have been in the um, Creative Writing Club over the years, too. So, so thank you for having me tonight. Um, so I have a, I have a friend who, who asked me one time, where's the strangest place you've ever made love? And I thought, whoa, what a great question. And then I started asking people, about that too. And so I started putting their answers into a poem. Some of them might be made up. You can decide. Yeah. But most of them, if not all of them, are absolutely true. So this is called uh, Friends Have Made Love in Strange Spaces. Ambulances. Dog houses. Their kids' tree houses. Bell towers. Clock towers, tower records, <laughs> Christmas crutches, canoes, reptile houses and failing zoos, on diving boards, altars, billboard catwalks. I see I'm hitting close to home with some of you. Billboard catwalks, bocce ball courts, trampolines. Hmm? on that bathtub-sized, gilt-framed Victorian mirror that once may have pleasured a brothel wall, propped in the scenic route antiques barn, till we roofed it home, let it gulp blue sky, gentled it onto the rug, windexed it, the glass breathing light, drawing depth, hmm, then swam together on that melting glacier above the fluid couple who quickened beneath us, wavery twins flashing below the surface who gave themselves fully flesh by flesh by flesh before breasting up to resume their labor to heft the mirror onto our parlor wall. Look how they grin, those wild ones those swingers. <laughs> this is a little poem that came fairly quickly and came from a story a friend, a friend told me. It's called The Argument. Tonight I think of the married couple living apart in distant states who date one night each week. They dine together via Skype, laptops propped on tables, each alone in the other's company, speaking of students and empathy, attempting one another with plump olives and chili and reds. Some nights, too tired to converse, one angles the Mac before the TV so they can view together Anderson Cooper or The Wire. A season three. And so the marriage goes, each in a state that denies their union, each licking lips and fingertips, mmm, the sea bass, ooh, the lamb, the distance between them less than the expanse between you wounded by words and me writing this roundabout apology.
So I've been writing poems. I, um, I, I didn't realize what they were about, I guess, until I, I was showing them to Mihaila when they were finished. And she, she looked at me and she said, oh, God, this is so sad. And I said, oh, I didn't realize how sad it is. I guess it is sad. And, and they're all poems about they're like aging, getting older, you know. And so, um, and so this is one of them. It's called Remember Body. Remember body, how you flashed like foil, loofage and mirrored and confettied with talc, wooing the mirror while slipping the shirt from its wooden hanger to silk over the serpentine muscles of outstretched arms and oxen yoke of your shoulders, its tail yielding like the fabled farmer's daughter as you palmed it down the vise of black jeans. Now your spine curls like the hook of that hanger, and your shoulders slump like surf at ebb tide. The sleek, the twin, a sleek, compact globes of your buttocks, on which your lover could bounce a quarter, sag and crimp like the jowls of a mastiff. <laughs> Remember, body, your sensual crimes, summoned back now by the thumbs of Masurus. Once you were so buff, once you were all shine. And here's a little postscript to that poem. Remember old tongue, how you love to lie. I was never buff, and I gave off less light than a firefly. <laughs> So there's, when you're in Romania, you see these signs all over the place in big letters, and I wish I could show you, but it's, it's I-E-S-I-R-E. -E. I-E-S-I-R-E. -E. And then there's an arrow pointing. Man. And so I kept looking at this sign, thinking, what's going on with this? And this is the poem that came from it. I keep thinking the meaning of the word must be desire. So want to follow its arrow to wherever it's pointing. That ballroom through which desire throbs like a wound, like the strings of the bass of Charles Mingus. That's the wherever where I'd like to be, at the groin's chernobling epicenter, on longing's narrow, precarious lip, on the viscous, pearlescent tip of desire. But the meaning of the word is exit, meaning, therefore, death, that space I'd rather avoid, an absence, abyss, an abscess raw as a screech chalking a blackboard, or louder and rippling outward, zeros, a ceaseless, starless, a staticky buzz, Unlike the seizure-inducing strobe, I keep pretending desire is. Here's the, um, the poem from which the title Celestial Joyride comes from. It's a little poem titled Old School. Seth wrestled the Camaro with one fist and popped handfuls of pills while the pistol rode on my thigh. I shouted, is it loaded? Over Grandmaster Flash. Amateur thug, he slipped the piece into his boot and swaggered like a bouncer into the funeral home. Sunglassed still and jittery, he scanned the room, swept past uncles to the open coffin, knelt there, then wedged the gun between our father's thumbs, insurance for the celestial joyride, and tattooed, pierced, and fucked up, bowed his shaven skull and wept. And I'll just read two more. I'm going to read two early poems, because I was thinking of um, the students we were speaking with tonight at dinner who were asking us questions about the creative process, how we get started, how did we ever begin, what keeps us going even, things like that. So I'll read these two early poems that are both about, about writing. This one is called The Mystery of the Caves. 
I don't remember the name of the story, but the hero, a boy, was lost, wandering a labyrinth of caverns, a filling stratum by stratum with water. I was wondering what might happen. Would he float upward toward light, or would he somersault forever in an underground black river? I couldn't stop reading the book because I had to know the answer because my mother was leaving again. The lid of the trunk thrown open, blouses torn from their hangers, the crazy shouting among rooms. The boy found it impossible to see which passage led to safety. One yellow finger of flame wavered on his last match. There was a blur of perfume, mother breaking miniature bottles, then my father gripping her, but too tightly, by both arms. The boy wasn't able to breathe. I think he wanted me to help, but I was small, and it was late. And my mother was sobbing now, no longer cursing her life, repeating my father's name among bright islands of skirts circling the rim of the bed. I can't recall the whole story. What happened at the end? Sometimes I worry that the boy is still searching below the earth for a thin pencil of light, that I can almost hear him through great volumes of water, through centuries of stone, crying my name among blind fish, and wanting so much to come home. And this is a poem called Horse. The first horse I ever saw was hauling a wagon stacked with furniture past storefronts along Knickerbocker Avenue. He was taller than a car, blue-black with flies, and bits of green ribbon tied to his mane bounced near his caked and roomy eyes. I had seen horses in books before, but this horse shimmered in the Brooklyn noon. I could hear his hooves strike the tar, the colossal nostrils snort back the heat, and breathe his inexorable, dung-tinged fume. Under the enormous belly, his swung like the policeman's nightstick, a dowsing rod longer than my arm. Even the Catholic girls could see it hung there like a rubber spigot. When he let loose, the steaming street flowed with frothy, a spattering urine. And when he stopped to let the junk man toss a tabletop onto the wagon bed, I worked behind his triangular head to touch the foreleg above the knee, the muscle jerking the mat of hair. Horse. I remember thinking, four years old and standing there, struck momentarily dumb, while the power gathered in his thigh surged like language into my thumb. Thank you very much.